Yes, at the front over here. Great, we've got a microphone at the top as well. Thank you. Thanks. Very brave, but we've got to start somewhere, haven't we? Good morning. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, my name is Isabel Angelowski. I work at the um, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona in an environmental institute called, called ICTA. And we recently published a study it has to do with the theme of green gentrification in Barcelona. How, in the end, the creation of green space or the restoration of ecological areas is actually ending up displacing residents because of land speculation and real estate prices that go up. So for me, the question of supporting leadership for healthy urban planning is how do you put urban planners and public decision makers more at the center of decision making that have to do with affordability of, of housing, what type of housing schemes can you create in ways that people who used to benefit, or let's say who used to live in a poor and contaminated areas without a lot of green space, can continue living there over the long time when their neighborhood gets revitalized. And so the theme of environmental justice, which I don't see very much here, um, at least, you know, at least not used very much in Europe, but in the US where I used to live, it's very present, is how do you create healthy and equitable neighborhood for everyone? Because you can see in Barcelona, there are neighborhoods who have, which have a lot of green space where only very privileged people end up living. And that's because of a lot of real estate yeah. dynamics of gentrification that happen. Okay, thank, thank you very much. That is an in incredibly good point. It's bring, brilliant to have it out so early. I mean, there's, there's, there's um, I'm just working with a, with a consortium of, of um, researchers and practitioners across Europe, and we've identified that as the key issue now for healthy cities, is that you make a section of the city healthier, yeah. and it displaces the population that you wanted to make healthier. That, that's really important. Just um, one more here on leadership or what you were talking about. Over, over here? There's a gentleman over here. Yeah. Go on. Is it working? Yeah. Yep. Gomers from uh, Germany, Dusseldorf. Uh, could you go one slide back, please? I think so. Yeah. This one? Yes. So the question to me, uh, or to us, was who is we? <laughs> because you said, uh, how can we support leadership? In terms of community, we are the uh, sort of leadership uh, compared administration with politics. And, and now the, the first issue, political leadership, uh, well, that's a kind of confusing, as you know, because it changes like, like every four or five years, depending on the countries or city, uh, cities' elections. And of course, uh, there's no real priority most of the time. There are things, they, they overwhelm you, like refugees, so you've got a priority around the Lord Mayor, uh, crisis sit sitting, setting every week. And then after this, you've got the next priorities, and the next priorities for a week, uh, you, you hit the papers, you hit the TV, television, and then it's another priority after that. So to me, actually, the, the uh, biggest challenge is to get an, an overall priority in terms of, of what we think of, that's why we're getting together here, but this seems to be kind of too slow, especially yeah for uh, political uh, happenings. OK, thank, thank you. That, it, that raises, I don't know what's happened with the projection, something. Um, raises some really good, good issues and good points. Um, I won't respond to that directly. I'm not here to answer things. But that's, that really you know, opens that up. And I think over the next few days, we really need to answer that. I mean, my own thoughts is that if we, I suppose the we means anyone who's listening to this, that we're in a room, we've both, both got to show leadership ourselves, but also support other people in showing leadership. There's a sort of dual nature. And if we don't do it, the planet or health will force us to. You know, I mean, we either get this agenda together or it becomes more and more important for humanity that we do. You know, it's, there isn't an option. Um, in terms of the breadth of the agenda, the way that we do it is to, is to join up and have these sort of meetings, I think. Um, Okay, I want to move on to 
yeah, reducing inequalities. Um, which might, some of it might, might, might address the, the, the earlier question we have, some of it might not. So, urban disease, the poverty, actually provided the rationale for modern planning. Certainly we've seen in many countries, the planning system came out of insanitary conditions, bad neighbors, foul smells, communicable diseases. And the huge advances in public health were in fact linked to sanitary engineers or to civil engineering as much as town planning. We're now faced with different problems. And really what we're seeing is that we've now got this sort of entrenched urban disease, but also rising health inequalities. And that's providing this renewed interest for this link between planning and health. In the communicable diseases, we used to have these uh, cholera, scrofula, which is sort of skin, horrible skin disease, typhoid, dysentery. Of course, we've mopped those up largely in Western towns. I mean, in, in um, slum developments, informal settlements, of course, this is still important. But also, it's this rise of non-communicable diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, some cancers that are attributed to environments, um, asthma, respiratory problems, stress, and mental illness. In fact, that the, the, interestingly, the comment about noise, uh, um, the big health impact about noise is not so much for parties of the neighbours, etc. and you can call the police or you can go to your neighbours and join in the party or tell them to turn the sound down. It's the background level of noise from traffic, road traffic, in the towns day and night that affects people, disturbs sleep, and causes stress and heart attacks. That, that, that's the big um, 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 impact that the WHO um, picks up. And that is um, accounting for, I've just got for Europe, 26 million disability adjusted life years. That means the equivalent of 26 million people having one year of disability added to their life. But of course, it's not distributed that way. It's distributed in a very inequitable way. So in the poorest neighborhoods, people are having disability life years added into their lives, 26 million in Europe. Um, and of course, you see, it's not, it doesn't hit the population even, evenly. The, these slides are from the Marmot Report um, for the UK, but each country, uh, Sir Michael Marmot, for his commission for equality and health has done work for the WHO. I think any country can get this sort of data, and certainly there's pan-European data. This is just in the UK, and this slide shows the life expectancy at birth for men, males, over time with the social class. So in 1972, in the um, lower social classes here, Life expectancy at birth, about 71 years old. But if you were born into a higher social class, social class one, you would expect to live to 77. That was 72. Over here, we can see that life expectancy has been increasing. Every decade, more and more life expectancy. But the gap here is actually wider. So for all our public health, the gap has not narrowed. It is slightly, this is from England, you might have different data. The gap is slightly wider. And what's more terrifying is that if you look at disability-free expectancy, so that was just life expectancy, it's like when you're gonna die, average. This is the age at which you will then have some sort of disability. So for the most deprived, so it goes from most deprived here in 10, in, in deciles almost, if you like, over here to the least deprived. So the most deprived in, and this is um, different areas of England, but in the worst area of England, the most deprived, by the time you're 50, you'll expect to live the rest of your life with some sort of disability, average. So you're not even hitting retirement, 65. You're not even getting a retirement where you're disability free, whereas the more wealthy classes are better off here. And so the more wealthy class here is getting a few years 
after average again. So if retirement was 65, they're getting seven or eight years disability free post retirement. And that's average. Of course, some people have a 20 years um, in retirement disability free. But th so the class difference here is incredibly important. Um, and the documents that I've seen of the projects here are quite right. This, the way of tackling this is a health in all policies because it cuts across. Um, it's not target. Yes, yeah, so you don't. It's not necessarily always targeting. And I think this this might address the, the point about displacement and gentrification. If you just go in and target certain areas and then you get displacement, it's about health in all policies: health in economic policy, health in retail policy, health in education policy, health in green policy, health in, as we, we've heard, energy policy, fuel poverty health and water policy. If you start to put health across all policies, you start to close that gap. Rather than targeting disadvantage here and there, you have to identify them, you have to target them, they might move away, then you, you, all that investment is lost. So it's about having health spread across all policies. And there's a big movement for that. It's called Health in All Policies, targets the key social determinants of health through inter integrated policy response across relevant policy areas with the ultimate goal of supporting health equity. And in a way, urban design is a health or in all policies response. It's a response to city planning and putting health into city planning, neighborhood planning, housing, uh, green space strategies. It's a health in all policies strategy. And the rationale, again, we come back to this thing, that health is influenced by social, environmental, and economic factors, which lie beyond the realm of the health sector. The health sector can't do the health inequality. They can't do the whole of it. It's got to be across society. Otherwise, it's just about curing diseases. Um, so we build in disease to our cities. And the market will go on delivering places where people do not thrive. The market isn't supplying places that support healthy lifestyles. In the UK, we build these attractive homes. They sell well, but they're behind walls, and they're in unattractive neighborhoods built with no concern for population health. We uh, have strung out local facilities. You couldn't design it better if you wanted to suppress walking. You know, if I wanted to suppress walking, walking as an urban designer, I would do this stuff. <laughs> I'd win an award. We build these lavish retail parks on the edges of towns, and they're 90% car dependent. And in the north fringe of Bristol, between 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock, you can't move, you can't leave work, but the whole of the grid is taken up with the fumes and the cars and the noise and the people's stress and trying to get home and wasting their time. But we built it like that. It needn't be like that at all. Childhood environments which lack stimulation. We're brilliant at this. Even building toxicity into high streets, and we build this sort of stuff, betting shops, money lenders, fast food, cheap alcohol, tanning salons, vapping in poorer. We build this into the most deprived neighborhoods. We don't find this in the richer areas. So then we've got to build our way out, fit towns to tackle obesity. So we've created obesogenic towns. That's in the Lancet. Someone coined that term, obesogenic towns. We've had the term in the, in the academic literature, depressogenic towns, we, we, towns to just depress people. Um, you know, we're building pathogenic towns, and we, get, we can scale that. It's neighborhoods, towns, cities, city regions, different scales. We can't even afford it, because to mop this stuff up, we're having to build bigger and bigger hospitals and spend more and more of our GDP on health. We can't even afford this if we wanted it. And of course, at the top, it says total UK health spending. It's not health spending, it's illness spending. It's mopping up the diseases that we've caused. Not all of it, of course, it's a proportion of it. So if we're talking about designing cities with a focus on well-being and health and reducing inequalities, again, I'm putting it to you. How do we ensure that city development reduces inequalities. So I'm putting that over to you. You can talk to the same person last time or choose to turn around or 
introduce yourself to a different person. So a couple of minutes on that. How, how do we do that? How are we going to reduce the inequalities? What can we do? A couple of minutes. Okay, okay, let's, um, so finish up what you were saying there. Um, again, I just want to, I just want us to be able to dip into maybe two of the conversations, just so we can all um, benefit from some of what's going on. So a cu couple of people, just to, to share some quick comments there on, on how the conversation was moving. A couple of people to share so we can all benefit from your conversations. Yeah, down at the front here, thank you. Hola, bon dia, jo exposaré si m'expresso més bé en català. Hola, bon dia. Aviam, jo que us posaré un exemple molt petit. Jo soc d'una alcaldessa d'un municipi de 3.700 habitants, però que té 21 nuclis de població, que prové de... molts... set d'aquests nuclis provenen d'un desenvolupament de la indústria tèxtil, de la revolució industrial del segle XIX, i que, evidentment, amb la crisi industrial va comportar la degradació de determinats barris perquè les colònies van deixar i va viure la gent gran. Aquests barris s'han ocupat per famílies que venen de zones de l'àrea metropolitana de Barcelona i també d'immigració. Llavors, evidentment, nosaltres hem observat que el que no podem fer és crear com petits guetos sinó que el que hem de promoure és la comunicació entre els barris i hem fet que aquesta separació física trencar aquesta barrera i hem comunicat amb passejos o camins saludables a aquests diferents nuclis de població. Ara, per exemple, estem promovent una activitat que és de senyalitzar amb rutes ja preexistents en combinació amb el centre de salut del municipi rutes saludables en què els metges recepten aquestes rutes a la població del nostre municipi i nosaltres informem, per exemple, aquestes senyals i quantes calories cremen. És a dir, tu d'aquí a aquí hauràs cremat determinades calories. És una manera diferent de promoure que la gent no tan sols sap el que ha recorregut, sinó també el que pot cremar. I llavors també estem treballant molt a l'escola. A l'escola estem promovent unes activitats extraescolars, donar trasllat als infants la importància de la vida saludable, de fer esport i d'una dieta equilibrada, perquè els nens són els que transmeten a la família aquestes necessitats.
Thank you. That that sounds like an amazing example, and the the um, support you're giving to people to be active um, can often um, have the knock-on effect that they will then use more of the green space or cycling and, and then demand better on changes to the built environment and support those changes. It's an interesting example there. I'd like to talk to you further about where that is as a case study. I'm going to move on um, a bit short of time, so I'm going to move straight on. And this partly answers... Oh, yeah. Did you? Bueno, es Castillo y Alvilá, es un municipio de la comarca... Castillo y Alvilá es un municipio de 3.700 habitantes a, la, a 50 kilómetros aquí de Barcelona. Y es, el proyecto es un proyecto que se está desarrollando ahora a Buenos Aires, ahora será la ciudad de Nueva York también, y sorprèn que sigui Castillo y perquè un dels promotors és un noi de Castillo y ha tingut aquesta sort y s'ha d'aprofitar. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to active citizenship, and in some ways, um, this can help um, answer or has some of the clues to reducing inequalities. And I'll show you some examples during this of my work in Bristol as well. So again, coming back to this diagram, I think I've got it in, I've got it in yes. Da -da. Um, it's not just a diagram of what is or what could be, it's a tool. And we use it. We use it with professionals, we use it in communities, we use it scoping what to do or the impact of something that's going to happen. And so here it is sort of in use, and you can see here um, a map, and there's an intervention happening, and we're looking at the impact on health with, um, in fact, these are two neighborhood um, health workers who go into the neighborhood and then talk to local people about what they're wanting and about how to change the neighborhood. Um, so we use this uh, methodology often called um, health walk audit um, with communities and their local environments, and it's very simple. We say, what keeps your community healthy? And then what detracts from health? And the two of them make up an agenda for action. And we use this as a walking study tour, walking, learning, walking and talking with the community. Maybe 25 people, and we walk in groups of five different areas with maps, and then we come back and we make an agenda. So here's some of the uh, communities in Bristol um, where we've been walking, just asking these simple questions, but with the health map, opening people's eyes to the way in which the physical environment either supports the health or detracts from health. And then we come back um, after walking for an hour or so, and then we make an agenda for action. With the simple column, all these things are detracting from health, all these things are supporting health, and in the middle, okay, this is some agendas. Um, so this is an example of the, the sort of final outcome. So the sun, these things are supporting health. The rain, these are things that are difficult for health, the air quality issues in West Street, um, evidence of litter in places, housing, territories in the public realm, there's a difficulty with um, housing, parking on the street corners, which stops old people and people with buggies crossing the road. And then in the middle, we have an agenda for action. And on the health walk, we also have um, cross sectoral professionals there. So there might be someone from the parks department, municipal parks, environmental health, a local councillor, and they can pick up easily. These are very specific things for that community. They can pick these up and feed them into all different plans. It's not in one plan. There's all different ways of solving these things. There's a, another one here in a, in a diff very difficult central area with a lot of um, Somali immigration happening there and community tensions. And again, what was good? What was bad? The community needs a voice, an agenda for health in the middle. Very simple methodology. The next level up, on a bigger scheme, we do a proper um, participatory health impact assessment, health scoping tool, um, on a much bigger day event to really collect the information from the community about how to make a scheme better. 
And if it's posed in the right way about making the scheme better, even the developers and the businesses are interested, the investors, because they want a better scheme. And this is the sort of outcome. And you can see it's mapped onto the health map. People, lifestyle, community activities, local economy, built environment. And we're scoring things and then creating an agenda. So we, we, you know, we can create healthy and sustainable places where people want to live. In San Francisco, I was recently had the opportunity to be at the International Conference on Urban Health. And I've just put this in because I've seen that Barcelona has a similar grid system um, to, to American cities. And there, they're putting in these bike priority lanes. And you can even cycle in about five kilometers now and it, on this thing called the Green Wave. If you go about 13 miles an hour, you don't get any red signals at any junctions. But the cars get loads. <laughs> So I was cycling into the conference, just straight through, kilometer after kilometer. And it's just prioritizing, just little things like that, slowly shift, modal, modal shift. Doesn't, the, the car drivers weren't up in arms about this because there's other routes they can go, and it just slowly moves the agenda and shifts people from one mode to another. So that's active citizenship. Slightly shorter time, so I'm not going to do another <laughs> round now. Um, I'll go straight on to life course approaches. But the question I would ask, of course, is how can we support our communities to demand healthier neighbourhoods? And what we're finding, you know, I really like the idea now that public administration is moving to enabling and supporting, because what I found in Bristol is that the local authority there are scared of increasing demands because they think they have to deliver anything. Marcus, don't... don't have people demanding better neighbourhoods because we're going to have to deliver it. But of course, they don't have to deliver it. And they can't deliver it. In times of austerity, that, that's not on the agenda. But what they can do is enable the delivery of it. That's their role. That's the leadership role. They can do that. So I would say not to be so scared about increasing citizens' demands because within the citizens' demands, you get the information about what to do. And if without that information, any investment is, is probably, you know, uh, the, the, well, many investments are the wrong, the wrong thing. Um, life course approach. So ageing is a success story. 60-year-olds now have the life of 40-year-olds from a century ago. Is this an older person? Age 71. What's the concept of an older person now? And there's a very big um, European age-friendly cities um, movement and methodologies and toolkits. And I've been working with the WHO on this, this component of it, outdoor spaces and buildings, and closely collaborating with a colleague working on transportation. So some of this material is from that. We've been looking at the evidence base. Many older people face barriers getting outdoors. And when we're saying older people, we're 65 plus, but there's all sorts of different age ranges on this. 52% of respondents in a certain survey said that the lack of public toilets in an area actually um, detracted from them going outdoors. Those living in residential care or sheltered homes are much more, less likely to get outdoors. People living close, older people living close to open or green spaces are more likely. We're focusing on out of doors because the biggest indicator for not needing hospital treatment or not seeing a GP for an older person is have they left the home more than twice a week? That's, the, that's a key indicator. If they've left the home more than twice a week, they're probably in a category that will need less social care, see the GP less, and less hospital admissions. So just getting out of doors, important for older people. The immediate home environment becomes very important. Obviously, there's going to be um, and in the United States, a lot of um, surveys on the loss of the driving license with age, immediately shrinking the social network virtually down to the family and not much beyond that. So the satisfaction with the neighbourhood is really important. And of course, whatever we do, because of the, the, this, 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 this diagram is about the life course approach to ageing. So whatever's happening up here on the range of function between different individuals, whether you're below the disability threshold here and you need services and uh, public care, or you're above it here, is things that are happening all your life, really. Early, it, it begins early, earlier life, adult life, older life. If you're not riding a bicycle and used to riding a bicycle, 
around this age, you're unlikely to be writing one in your 60s. So the life course approach means that what we do for children is also we're doing for older age, creating safe places, supporting healthy lifestyles. So the big themes for a healthy environment across the ages, everyday movement and accessibility, opportunities for social interaction and recreation, outdoors, and supporting safe and inclusive communities. So I'm just going to move on now. So, you know, have we filled in these boxes? Are we going to fill these boxes in over the next two days? I hope so. Um, we'll certainly be given a flavour of what could be in these boxes. And I think urban planning, green spaces, housing, and facilities are certainly the right way in terms of the built environment. And then in terms of the more soft approaches, this innovative leadership, reducing inequalities, active citizenship, and life course approaches gives a real sort of soft and policy way into that inner health in all policies approach. I love this final um, definition from the Ottawa Charter, World Health Organization, the Ottawa Charter. Health is created and lived by people within the settings of their everyday life where they learn, work, play, and love. And the Healthy Cities Movement signs up to the Ottawa Charter. That's at the core of the Healthy Cities Movement. Can we form a consensus, maybe, or during the com conference? You know, wh what are the issues that cities need to prioritise? And it's not just cities, of course. It's city regions, it's neighbourhoods, it's it all, all the spatial scales. What are the issues to prioritise? What kind of interventions might, we, might be effective? And not just hard interventions, also the soft interventions, the governance, the leadership, the different organisations, etc., that are needed. And what are the constructive steps that we can take to take this agenda further? And I hope those are the sort of conversations that we can have at this conference today and tomorrow. And I'm just going to finish with just showing you a bit of the work that I'm doing now. Um, I'm passionately interested in this gap between what we know and what we do. And I've been in scholarship and academia for a number of years, but also crossing that boundary and working in the city. And in academia, I see the knowledge just piling up in the journal articles. And in the cities, I just see sort of business as usual or the, the, the finances are being cut off, so we have to spend the money quickly, whatever it is. There's all sorts of other pressures in cities. And how do we bridge that gap? And it comes up time again in, in the literature with the WHO, etc. cetera. Um, and I've written some guidance for designers here. I'm going to show you. <laughs> so there's a, a book of guidance for designers here that actually has examples and uh, rules of thumb and metrics and distances to green space and densities of population and all sorts. So this is the actual desktop guide. It's for communities, designers, urban designers. It's in its second edition. It's so popular, we're going to go to a third edition and put in more evidence base and update it. I noticed it's, it's missing a few um, pressing issues at the moment that are more on the agenda. We've also created... Um, just published last year, a reader, more for policymakers and also sort of academic scholarship. Um, I've, there was, I'll put around some sort of flyers with information to this on the desk out there. But my biggest um, and new um, endeavour now is to launch a new journal. And this will come out, it's a brand new journal, it'll come out the first edition in 2017. It's with Routledge. Routledge, you're an academic publisher. But what I've sold to them is, yes, let's have the academic papers, but let's also talk about city know-how. Let's have people in cities, leaders in cities, speaking to the academics about what they want to be researched, about what knowledge they want, and how to communicate it. So I'm going to ask, be asking all the academics to give a one-page summary in a language that city practitioners can understand about what you've found out, what people do in cities now and how they need to do it differently and start those conversations. So that's called the city know-how um, function in this new academic journal. I think that's about my last slide. So city know-how, we've got to get the information 
out into cities and off the uh, shelves of the universities. Thank you. If there are any questions, you can address them to Marcus during the coffee break. And I would like to invite the next speakers to the stage, please.